So now, memories of the Navy Lark, Doctor Who and much more as we enjoy an hour in the company of John Pertwee or possibly Helen Twelve Trees in a cunning disguise. <laughs> Forgive me sitting upon this stool. This is a new gimmick that is used by artists these days. The idea, of course, is to give an impression of relaxation. It is what is known in my profession as the Dave Allen myth. <laughs> if an actor doesn't know what to do with his hands, he has a walking stick. If he doesn't know what to do with his mouth, he has a cigarette. I have a stool. <laughs> now, my name is John Pertwee, which it isn't. Not truly, my real name is Jean de Pertuis de Laieuvre, and I hope you're very impressed. <laughs> I come from a long line that my mother should never have listened to, a French line of Huguenots. The majority of my family was in fact Catholic in France in 1865, and they pushed out the Protestants. And there was one Protestant, a man called Georges de Pertuis de Laieuvre, and he came and he moved into Suffolk, and the large Pertuis clan, as it's known today, is the result of his personal athleticism. <laughs> and nobody could pronounce the name properly, Pertuis, Pertuis de Laieux, P-E-R-T-H-U-I-S, they couldn't pronounce it, so the illiterate English pronounced it Pertuis. So it was duly changed to P-E-R-T-W-E-E. As with the result is they called it Pee-wee, etc., etc. <laughs> and when I was in America, I was working on Broadway, and I used to walk down Broadway, and I looked up, and there it was, John Pertwee, and I was so proud of the fact my name was in lights. And after six months, I walked into the theatre one day, and there was the stage doorkeeper, sitting at the end of the passage, smoking his big stogie, and he said, hey, Jan. And I paid no attention, of course, my name not being Jan, and I walked on, merrily into the theatre, <laughs> and he said, hey, hey, psh, Jan. And I said, who, me? He said, yeah, Jan Putrid, there's a letter for you. <laughs> So from that moment onwards in America, I was always known as Jan Putrid, which I suppose is better than when I was standing outside Grosvenor House many years ago. Somebody came up to me and said, excuse me, but weren't you John Pertwee? <laughs> That's nice, isn't it? Weren't you John Pertwee? And a lady, this is an extraordinary story. It's not that funny, but it's an extraordinary story. There's a lady, and she came up to me when I was with a great dear friend of mine, and she said, excuse me, but aren't you Helen Twelve Trees? <laughs> And I said, Ellen Twelve Trees is a very elderly character actress. And she said, that's right. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> On another occasion, I remember getting into a train. I was going to see a Doctor Who conference. And I usually wear the sort of Doctor Who gear when I go to these conferences. And I had my Doctor Who cape on. And I, I tried to find somewhere in this train that was empty. And there were, the whole train was absolutely full. And I walked up, and there was a compartment that was empty, but it had a little label stuck in the window. It said, this compartment is reserved for people from St. Thomas's Hospital. And so I thought, well, there's nobody there, so I'll go in. And I sat down, and just as the train was leaving, the door opened, and in came two men in white coats with a collection of people, all a bit uh, doolally taps. They all sat down very happily, and the nurse thought he'd count everybody up and check them all out, and he said, uh, right, now let's have you, and let's have a little count here. Now then, uh, one... Two, and he looked at me, he said, who are you? And I said, I'm Doctor Who. He said, four, <laughs> five, six. <laughs> anyway, as I was telling you, I come from a long theatrical family. My father was Roland Pertwee. He was an eminent playwright, and you, some of you may remember as a writer. He was a scenarist. He, he worked a lot in Hollywood and in England writing movies. My uncle Guy... He looked after me when I was very little because my father and mother split up when I was tiny. My mother took one look at me and went, oh, no, and she left. <laughs> and so my granny looked after me. And my Uncle Guy, too. I just tell you, we'd like to take um, Guys, look here, mother. Miss bought me, I, he taught elocution as a lesson. <laughs> He was the professor of the Guildhall of School of Music and Drama at the Guildhall, and he taught elocution. Extraordinary how he managed. He was the only man I ever knew who had a motor car, 
And he didn't change gear to go uphill, he leant forward slowly. <laughs> Uncle Guy, my grandmother was an opera singer. She had the sort of voice that you used to augment grief at funerals. <laughs> Lovely voice though she had, Dame Eva Moore, her daughter was Jill Esmond, and Jill Esmond married Laurence Olivier, the world's greatest actor, in my opinion, it was. And let me give you an example of why I say that. He was very shy in many ways. He didn't like people approaching him from the back. Understandable in some ways, but he did from the front, fine. The back, no, no. And we went to a party once. And I said, come on, Larry, we're going to this lovely party. He said, no, no, I'd really rather. I said, yes, you're going. He said, I, 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 I said, yes, you're going. So we took him and we put him on a sofa and we, we gave him drink and a sandwich. And we said, no, you'll be all right. And he started to relax when an elderly lady came up behind him and she clapped her hands over his eyes and she said, guess who? And that's exactly the sort of thing he hated. So he went, what? and the lady fell backwards and she fell against the settee behind and she went AOT over the settee with the legs in the air with the black bombazine knicker well to the fore. And, and he paid no attention to it at all and he went over to his host and he said, who is that old woman? He said, oh, that's my mother-in-law. He said, isn't she marvellous? <laughs> Doesn't that prove to you that's the world's greatest actor? Anyway, my father married again. He married a lady called Dorothy. I didn't care for her at all. She was the sort of proverbial stepmother as far as I was concerned. And so when they went down to Devonshire to live, we had a house on the River X down in Dulverton, near Tiverton. It was a, a great life, really, for a boy. We had a farm and we had uh, horses for hunting. We had the house on the top of a hill and the postman used to come and he used to deliver letters for miles around the farms. He'd walked the equivalent of four times round the world in gumboots. So you can imagine the condition of his feet. On his way in, he used to call into the pubs, you see, and have a few pints of scrumpy. And so by the time he got to our house, he'd had a few, you see. And he used to look up at the house on the top of the hill and he'd look and he'd say, Oh, poor God, I ain't going up there. <laughs> Boy, no, I ain't going up there. Let them young bastards come down and get it. <laughs> and with that, he'd take the letters and he'd throw them over the gate into the field, into the mud. And my father would be looking through his binoculars and said, Good God, the damn man's done it again. And he said, go on, boys. He said, down you go, a penny each to each of you collecting the mail and bringing it up. Now, he had a rather too many scrumpies and he wasn't too fit. So they got another postman and they hauled him out of retirement. And he was extremely old. He was 83. And he had, he had his old hat that he'd been using. And one of them four peak and half hats. Do you remember? Anybody remember him? He had a little postman's hat, a little thing, you know, that hard hat. Well, his name was Park Curtis, and he was uh, over 18, and he had eyebrows that stuck up there like that. <laughs> and Park Curtis said, Coral, he said, I'm going to be the fastest postman in the West Country. He said, don't worry about that. He said, I'm going to be faster than would have come in his gumboots. I get a bike. And he bought a racing bike. <laughs> 83 years of age, he bought a racing bike with bent handlebars and a very hard saddle. <laughs> And he used to deliver the letters at enormous speed. And one day he disappeared. We couldn't find him anywhere. And I said, where's Pa Curtis? They said, haven't you heard? Oh, he said he's had a terrible accident. He said he was going up Studley Hill, he said, against the wind. He said he's head down, his ass in the air, pedaling away up the hill. He said, and he'd been down so far, he got his eyebrows caught in the front spokes. <laughs> He said, add him off, quick as a trice, he said. He said, he's in the hospital. And so I went to see him and I said, Pa, what have you done? Or he said, I, I was going too fast, he said, Master John, too fast. And I said, well, I'll tell you something, Pa, I'll give you a good bit of news. I said, I've just put on the air on a radio show, I've got a postman. And I call him Postman Curtis. And I said, and it's all based on you. So when you listen and you hear an old man say, wow, what does it matter what you do, so long as you tear him up? That's you. <laughs> do you remember that character? Do you? Yeah, a long time ago. Waterlogged Spa with Eric Barker, and that was based on old Park Curtis. Now, of course, during this period of time I was at school. Not for very long at any school. That's the story of my life, really. 
I was expelled from everything. I went to a school called Ald Road, Eastbourne. I was seven and a half years of age and was beaten and thrashed for swinging on a lavatory chain. Still, I had great fun. I mean, I really enjoyed it. I went to another school after that, which I enjoyed. It was a headmaster called P.C. Underhill. He weighed about 22 stone and ex-rowing blue. He didn't beat you with a cane. He beat you with a fives bat. So with 22 stone behind him, when he hit you with the five bat, your head went straight through the wall opposite. <laughs> but the extraordinary thing was I liked him. I liked him. I, I, through my life, I've, I've sort of liked the most extraordinary people, people who are fierce and, and supposed to be bad and supposed to be angry and supposed to frighten you, and they don't. And I liked him. I wasn't expelled from there. I went to Sherburn, Sherburn Public School after that. Hated that. Hated the whole system of fagging. Hated everybody in it. And I was uh, expelled from Sherburn because uh, I did a great and original thing which went into the history books. I beat my fag master. Instead of him beating me, I beat him. And my father decided the best thing to do was to superannuate me and remove me. And send me to another school. I was, went to a co-educational school with girls. <laughs> What a splendid arrangement. <laughs> I did enjoy myself. I built an open air theatre there. I learned languages there. I had a marvellous time. A wonderful life. Frenchham Heights. I thoroughly recommend it. A great house and a great, great school. I rode a motorbike there once and I drove it straight into a wall within 15 minutes of buying it. As I hit the wall, I went over the wall and hit in the middle of a tea party. And somebody said, oh, hello, you're late. Then, that, that was a wonderful original line. And I left school. I decided the best thing I was doing was going to the theatre. Everybody else in my family had been in the theatre, of course. And so I decided that uh, I'd try to get into uh, a dramatic school. And I, I said, I'll go to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. Oh, I, I, I thought I'll get in there. Yeah, sure I will. Mark you, my father was a governor, so I did stand a little chance. <laughs> so I went to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, and I hadn't been there more than two terms before I was sent for by the principal of Sir Kenneth Barnes. And he said, not hurt me. I'm going to tell you, I'm very much afraid. I'm going to fire you. And I said, why? And he said, I have been speaking to your Greek teacher, Mrs. Wheeler, and she tells me that you have refused to be a wind. I said, well, yes, it's perfectly true. I have refused to be a win. I mean, it's pretty silly, my father, paying all this money for my education in the theatre, and now all I've got to do is go, ooh, ooh, that's what you do as a Greek win. Ooh, hundreds of you, lying in the side, going, ooh. And I said, no, I don't want to be a Greek win. I want to be an actor. And he said, you'll be a win and like it. And I said, no, I'm sorry. And he said, very well. You will leave at the end, at the end of this term. So I thought, well, I didn't last there long. <laughs> I did a play at the end of that term. In that play, as all students, you know, you play more than one part. I played the part of the man who was murdered in the first act, and I played the part of the detective who found out who murdered me in the last. <laughs> I had great makeup. Her hair parted in the middle, a little tash and a monocle for the first character, and then the detective, you know, the dirty old raincoat and the battered hat and everything. And I was really rather proud of myself. And there were only two very small parts. But when it was over, Kenneth Barnes said to Noel Coward, who was the guest of honour, and he said, there was there, was there, did you think, did you, yes, did you find any talent? Did you, were you impressed? Did you, did you like, did you? And Noel Coward just very interesting, very, very good performance for a man who played the part of the man who was murdered in the first act. And I particularly liked the part of the detective uh, who found it who murdered him at the last. Well, having played both parts, I was naturally very thrilled, and so I leapt forward and gave him a kiss, and a very dangerous thing to do. <laughs> but as he was a sort of guru of mine, a sort of godfather of mine, a great friend of my dad's, it was all right, and he was a great influence on my life in the theatre from then on. And I actually had the joy of working with him. Amazing wit, that lovely story about Noel Coward when he was watching the coronation. And it was a terrible day in the coronation, you may remember some of you. It was pouring with rain and the Queen wanted to be in the open carriage and she couldn't because she'd been soaked. And everybody would have been soaked, so they were all in the carriages sort of doing this, you know, through the windows. And all the crowd was sitting out in the rain. It was awful. It was a heartbreaking day. But Noel Coward was sitting in a grandstand, covered and quite, quite dry. 
And all the carriages went by, and when he and his friend were looking and saying, oh, very good, very good, very boring. <laughs> and suddenly an open carriage went by with a lady in it, a vast lady, Queen Salotti of Tonga. And she'd melted. All the rain had melted her. And her hat hung down like spaniel's ears. And sitting opposite to her was a little man in a top hat and a morning coat, and he'd melted too. But she was beaming and smiling all over her face and she was waving to everybody. The crowd went mad. They thought, what a marvellous woman. And so this man, he didn't know who she was, this friend of Noel Cards. He said, no, extraordinary woman. Who on earth is that? And he said, oh, don't you know, my dear boy? That's the Queen of Tonga. He said, isn't she marvellous? Who's the little man sitting opposite to her? Noel Cards said, her lunch. <laughs> no. I then joined a thing called the Arts League of Service Travelling Theatre, which was a bus with all the scenery on the top of the bus and all the actors and actresses on the bottom of the bus. And we did a programme of 150 items and they were able to choose 10 items wherever we went, a different place every single night. They chose 10 items, but two had to be extracts from the classics. And we stayed with the butcher and the baker and the candlestick maker. You never knew who we were going to stay with, which was wonderful. And I learnt an enormous amount. It was directed by Donald Wolfitt, the last tour great, great actor. I joined Brighton Repertory Company where I was paid the grand sum of three pounds, ten shillings per week. I lived in digs, they cost me 30 shillings, one pound, ten shillings, and I had three meals a day. Wonderful. I was walking down the street one day when I ran into an actor called John Salew, and John Salew said, you speak West Country, don't you? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, nip up to this studio in Bond Street. He said, go there. And he said, no, when you're in there, just say that I'm terribly sorry, I can't turn up today because I'm filming at Pinewood and I've sent you instead. And so I went up, and the producer was furious. He said, what the hell's he talking about? Who the hell does he think he is? He said, I, I, I don't just get people off the street. I said, no, as a matter of fact, I said, I am known to the son of, of the man who owns the company, and I can do the voice. He said, you can? I said, yes. He said, go on, do it. And so luckily, it was a West Country farmer. Roy, I said, that's no problem at all. There's a show called Marmaduke Brown with Ernest Clark played the lead, played Marmaduke Brown. So I did it, and they said, yeah, that's all right. That's not bad at all. He said, you got the job. And so I did it, and I played the gardener, the Marmaduke Brown. I rushed back home, and I phoned my agent, and I said, Morris? He said, yes. And I said, I've got good news. He said, oh, yes. And I said, John Sillew, I met in the street. He said, yes, I know. And I said, and, and he sent me there, and I've got the job. He said, yes, I know. And I said... Well, what else do you know? He said, I know that you've got every other job Mr. Salou does there. I said, what do you mean? He said, you're doing Mr. Reader, you're doing Stella Dallas, you're doing Young Widow Jones, you're doing all of them. That could make 25 programmes a week, and you're paid two guineas a programme. You're going to make a lot of money, young man. And I said, well, you don't sound very happy about this. He said, I'm not. And I said, why? He said, I handle John Salou as well. <laughs> and that was unfortunate, but I didn't care. And I worked on Radio Luxembourg, more or less up to the start of the war. I was in a play called To Kill a Cat. Unfortunately, the producer was of a certain persuasion, which I wasn't. So he touched me up and I said, don't do that. <laughs> uh, he, I said, because if you do, I'll knock you into the orchestra pit. And, <laughs> and he did it again, and I knocked him into the orchestra pit. <laughs> Not a good idea when you're starting off in the theatre. Not a good idea at all. He was uh, injured, and so I was fired. I was expelled once again. And so I thought, well, what else can I do? Well, I'll join the services. The war had started. And so I said, what am I going to join? I'm not going to join the Air Force. I'm too frightened to join the Air Force. How anybody could ever do what pilots did, I never know. The bravery of people getting into a plane and going out and flying over enemy territory night after night. Amazing courage. I wasn't going to join the army because I'd had nightmares about trenches and rats and bayonets and things because I was born in 1919, just after the First World War, and so I, I thought, no, no, not for me. I'll join the Navy. Yes, because you're a long way away from the enemy. <laughs> if you go into action, you're a long way away, and they might miss. And also, the food isn't bad. And also, of course, not to forget, all the nice girls love a sailor. I forgot that I was desperately seasick, even on the round pond. I was terribly seasick. And they put me into battlecruisers, and they put me into a ship called HMS Hood. 
And HMS Hood was the biggest battle cruiser in the British fleet. It did 42 knots. It weighed 43,000 tons. It had a complement of 1,768 men. And I was in Russian convoys. And uh, believe me, that was tough. It was very cold. Seas, I promise you, that were 85 feet high. And that's no lie. And when you get 42,000 tons going whap, and you didn't go over the top, you went into the middle, and then it came out the other end, and then they're down on the sea, and spray would shoot over the ship. And I was in the spotting top. I was a spotter up in the spotting top, covered in about 18 overcoats and about seven hats and balaclava helmets. And when it went down like that and the spray went, I used to duck down quick because... The water froze instantly and turned itself into icicles. And can you imagine a more ridiculous way of dying than being stabbed to death by an icicle? (laughs) That would have happened, believe me. And we were up in Russian convoys and then the Wolfpack submarines came out because the spotting aeroplanes used to come round and round the Fock Wolves, go round and round and round. And our gunnery officer had a great sense of humour. And he was looking up at this aeroplane once we were off Mamansk and our kings were on the plane was going round and round and round. And he said, Hey, you up there, Fritz. For God's sake, go round the other way, boy. You're making us dizzy. <laughs> and we thought, that's a very funny man. And back came an answer from the German pilot said, Certainly, anything to oblige the British, and did. <laughs> you would not believe it. There was, in the early days, there was a certain sense of humour. They soon forgot all about the sense of humour after the war been on a couple of years. Now, unfortunately, as you all probably know, the hood came unstuck. She sailed into action against the Bismarck, the biggest battleship in the world, and the fastest, and the hood was quick, but she'd had her magazine hatch covers made into very thin ones and make her light enough to catch the Bismarck, because she was quick. It was an unhappy ship because we never believed that it would take much of a whack that it would probably explode. And what happened as we were closing in, I was a CW candidate, and which meant meant that I was an officer candidate. My captain had sent for me and said, tell me about Radio Luxembourg. And I said, oh, do you really want to know? So he said, yes, I've always wanted to know. How do you do it? And I told him for 20 minutes. He said, right, okay, that's lovely. And I said, excuse me, what was that all about? He said, oh, you just passed a CW candidate's (laughs) course thing. You know, that's your interview. I said, oh, thank you very much indeed, sir. Does that mean I can go? And he said, yes, you can go. I didn't realise that when he said you can go that I was going to be over the side of that ship. And I was down over grappling ropes and I went down the netting and I went into a drifter and I was taken off to a ship called the Dunluce Castle back at Scapa Flow. And the hood just sailed on and it got the first shell into the Bismarck. Bismarck then got the range of a hood and the awful thing was the third salvo landed forward of X turret, A, B, X, Y, and it went straight down through two wooden decks, hit the armoured deck, exploded, and because of these thin hatch covers, they just blew in and the blast went down, hit the magazine, and whoosh, the ship exploded. It went down in nine and a half seconds. 1,768 men died and three survived, leading Seaman Tilburn, the Midshipman Dundas and Sigelman Briggs. This was a dreadful thing, and of course I was absolutely heartbroken about this, because I lost all my friends and my mates, and... It was a dreadful thing to happen. And when I got back, all the letters from my parents had been returned saying the addressee of this envelope is missing, presumed killed. And so therefore, when I arrived in the flat and opened the door and said, Hi, Dad! He said, Oh, no. (laughs) My father's sense of humour. Well, we went then from then on survivor's leave and I went down to Portsmouth Barracks as a CW candidate. And while I was at the CW candidate, I met up with a man called Chief Petty Officer Branch, uh, who used to say, Right, oh, let's rock, Mr. Bill! And it was one of these people that everybody was frightened of. And he said, Right, oh, come on in, Pee Wee, come here. My God, he said, Get your bloody hair cut, you look like a bleeding chrysanthemum. <laughs> and I, I corpsed and I started to laugh. He said, What are you laughing at? And I said, What you, sir? He said, What are you, what are you laughing at me for? I'm not supposed to be funny. I said, well, you are, sir. You're very funny. He said, you're supposed to be frightened of me. And I said, well, I'm not, sir. He said, well, try for Christ's sake. <laughs> he said, he said, right, get all, get all these men and march down the end of the parade ground. 
and turn them about. So I said, right, squall, by the left, quick, boat, and off they went. And when they were gone about the length of this theatre, I said, squall, boat. He said, well, what you wait for it, I'll tell you when. And I, I said, but can I? He said, I'll tell you when. I said, they were disappearing, almost out of sight. And I, I said, squall, about. He said, not yet. I'll tell you when. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I then, I really clutched the gluteals and said, squad, about, turn. Now, the men at the back heard me. They turned about. The ones in the middle thought I said right turn, and they went that way. <laughs> the ones on the left went that way, and the ones in the front heard nothing, and they went straight on. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. He said, come on, get them back together, lad. And so I said, squad, about, Turn! And this they all heard, and they all turned, and... <laughs> <laughs> and Chief Petty Officer Branch said, yes. Well, now I know what they mean when they say, Marines will advance in columns of fours, and matelows in friggin' great heaps. <laughs> I love that man. Weeks later, I was in G Block in Portsmouth Barracks, and I was fire watching. And an incendiary bomb came through the roof and I, I, I put a sandbag on the top and I jumped on it to put it out, which is very stupid because it went through the ceiling into the hammocks <laughs> and started a raging inferno. And there were six of us up there and we were going to be barbecued. And so I said, right, everybody out, lads. And they all went down the ladder and I was the last out. And I looked to see if there were any more and there weren't. So I came down the ladder. At that precise minute, the Germans dropped a landmine on a parachute. At the end of the building, it blew up the regulating petty officer's block it killed many RPOs, it blew the end of our building off, the blast came in, hit the wall, sucked me out, which blast does extraordinary things, and I went backwards uh, through this mess room with the girders going <laughs> over my head, and I went out of the hole at the end of the building and landed, bang, in, in the middle of all the rubble of the exploded and the blown up building. Well, I mean, I was in a terrible state. I was covered in blood. I was black. I was deaf. And when the men came round with the paddy wagons and with the stretchers, and they found me on the top of the building. Obviously, I was dead. So they picked me up and they put me on the stretcher and they took me over to the officer's mess and they took me into the mortuary. And the mortuary was the larder. They thought, what a good idea. You know, nice marble slabs, very good. We'll put the, all the dead in there. And so they put me on, on a slab in the larder of the officer's mess. I'd never been in the officer's mess before. <laughs> and, and there I was on the larder, and I woke up, and there was an arm hanging above me. And I pulled the arm, I said, oh, oh, and the body went, bleh, bleh, and fell on the floor. He was dead. And I called, I said, hey, but wait, wait. And the door opened, and a white-faced sick birth attendant came out, and said, oh, of course. I said, here, this man's dead. He said, blimey, mate, I thought you friggin' well was. <laughs> And so they picked me up and they took me back to Hasler Hospital. And when I came out, I was ready for my CW candidates course. I was then going to be an officer at sea, I thought. But unfortunately, I couldn't add. I can't work without a calculator or fingers and toes. <laughs> so when we had the exam papers, I was terribly neat. I drew a picture of a lovely galleon and I got three marks for neatness. <laughs> but nothing for navigation. So I said... Please, I said, D -d -d don't send me back to sea because you know, I'll die. Um, I can't be any longer at sea. I've done my sea time, surely. There must be something I can do uh, as an officer. And so the captain, Captain Pelly, said, yeah, I suppose, all right. So we'll put you in special branch. And he put me in special branch, which, gave, which you had special jobs, rather strange jobs. A, a French officer suddenly appeared. And I heard him talking to my divisional officer. And he said, where, where is he? And he said, over there. And he came over and said, you pertry? And I said, yes, he said, I don't know, I said, eh, what? Never volunteer for anything, see. Nothing to do with French. Ooh. No, 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 you know, with D-Day, no, 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 keep well away from that, no. Do something in Scotland, no, no, France, no. And I said, no, no, je ne parle pas, je suis très mal. He said, but in your papers, it says that you are a French family, that you, you naturally, you speak French. And he said, I said, no, no, I used to, but I, I don't anymore. So he said, that's very... <laughs> He said, that's very, very strange. I will talk to you later, although I'm in the dead trouble here. And he went up and he spoke to a fellow called Rankin. And he said, uh, you are Rankin? And he said, yes, sir. He said, do you parle français? He said, uh, oui, je parle français. Oui, je parle très, ma pas très bon, mais je parle. Uh, and uh, I went, oh, my God. Uh, uh, and, and he said, uh, follow me, uh, Rankin. And he went into the office. 
and he came out a few minutes later and I rushed up to him and I said, Tony, right, come on, tell me, what was the job? He said, resident naval officer in Tahiti. <laughs> Could you believe it? Years later, I was in Tahiti and I stayed there for quite a time. And I got to know a fellow called Freddie Devonish, who was the British consul, and he'd been there in the Navy during the war. And I said to him one day, Freddie, did you by any chance know a fellow called Tony Rankin? And he turned round to one of the girls sitting alongside me and he said, Ah, you hear what old poetry he wants to know? He wants to know if we know old Boom Boom Rankin. <laughs> I said, Thank you very much indeed, sir. That's exactly what I want to be. <laughs> So I went back into another job with Naval Intelligence Division on security staff, which was fun, because I spent a certain amount of time in, in the war meetings behind the head of Naval Intelligence, and uh, Churchill sat at the end, and he used to smoke his cigars and uh, put these cigars out in an ashtray, and when the, the meetings were over, everybody would leap up, and I'd leap up, and I'd say, right, sir, carry on, thanks, sir. Thank you, sir. There's you click the papers, and so we'll clear up Mr. Churchill's thing. And I'd take the ashtray with all the cigar butts and like that into a little bag that I carried, and I used to sell the butts for $25. <laughs> Believe me, a butt of a Churchill cigar was worth a lot of money in those days. We were up to all sorts of dodges. I enjoyed my time with NID, particularly because it was a very good tea boy. He made a marvellous cup of tea, and I, his name was Callaghan, actually, James Callaghan. Yeah, <laughs> that's him, yes. And uh, he was in the same division. Whenever I see Jim Callaghan now, I say, Jim, make us a cup of tea, this is a good lad. <laughs> He's lovely. John Paddy Carstairs, the film director, and a lot of strange people, and we enjoyed the job. I must tell you a couple of things that we did. You'd never believe how stupid people can be. I, a friend of mine in the division, hired a costume of German officers with the hats up and the iron cross and the boots. And we walked, the two of us, the whole way from Piccadilly Circus right up to the BBC. And the whole way up we walked and people saluted us. <laughs> now, if we'd been lynched, it would, would have been our own fault entirely. You couldn't believe it. I joined then, after that, the naval broadcasting section, and while I was there, a young sailor appeared, and his name was David Jacobs. <laughs> and he was about 17, he'd lied about his age to get in, and I became one of his greatest friends, and he still is one of my greatest friends, and his mother used to give us the most wonderful food. His father was a fruit mer merchant in Covent Garden, and so we had wonderful meat, because he used to, you know, swap this for a bit of that, and that, a bit of this, and we lived well. While we were there, we used to go around on trips and listen to people's conversations, and I was fascinated. We were going up from Parliament Square up to Trafalgar Square, and there's a theatre up at the end called the Whitehall Theatre, and had a play on it called uh, Seagull Over Sorrento. A very popular play, a service play. And there were two girls sitting in front of us, and one girl said, Here, Philly, so I'm going to the theatre Thursday. The other one said, Oh, yeah, what are you going to see? She said, I think it's called Sea Lions in Toronto. <laughs> And the other one said, oh, that sounds nice. She said, is that the one with the Chinaman in it? The other one said, no, I don't think so. She said, pity, I like a Chinaman in a play. <laughs> now, would you believe dialogue like that? I mean, it is extraordinary. There's nothing funnier. As they say, there's not so cool here as folk. And believe me, when you listen to what some people say, I'll give you some examples. One girl said to the other one, she said, yeah, she said, budge up, Phyllis, I've only got one cheek on. She said, how's your dad? She said, oh, he's better, but he still has to stand sideways. <laughs> I worked at the Café de Paris in London and I came out of the kitchens. I wasn't going to come down the stairs after Marlena Dietrich and Noah Coward. I, I couldn't have the gall to do that. I came through the kitchens and the things I heard in the kitchens, I mean, there was one wonderful thing where a waiter came in and he banged a tray down and he said, oh, well, he's eaten it. <laughs> Eaten what? It's incredible, isn't it? I remember listening to Cabaret and there were two magicians and one magician turned to the other and said, you know, boy, you've got no idea how difficult it is to get a budge regard out of a treacle tart. <laughs> now, these are all true, I swear. My director, James Hill, who directed Wurzel Gummidge, he heard a lovely conversation where a girl said, So, I stood there till my vest was wringing wet. <laughs> the other one said, Yes, well, you would, wouldn't you? <laughs> she said, Could it have been a horse? 
She said, no. No, it was nibbled. And I know nibbling when I see it. <laughs> she said, could it have been a rabbit? She said, no. Rabbits can't reach hanging baskets. <laughs> now, what the hell was that all about? <laughs> oh, I just, I love it. I love that sort of conversation. Anyway, David and I had, uh, had great fun in this division. And while I was there, I had to uh, check up on various people saying naughty things on radio. There was a show called Mediterranean Merigo around then with Eric Barker. And he was being rather rude about my Lords of the Admiralty. And so I was sent along to check up on him. And when I was there, he said, I want somebody to shout out something from the audience. And I said, I'll do it. He said, what's your name? I said, Pertwee. And he said, are you a member of the Pertwee family? I said, yes. He said, oh, good, yeah, you can do it. And I had to shout out a line. He and his wife, Pearl Hackney, were arguing. And I had to say, oi, leave him alone. You're always picking on the poor perisher. And she's supposed to turn around and she say, who on earth is that? And Eric's supposed to look into the audience and say, oh, that's the Minister of Education. <laughs> now, that's precisely the kind of joke I was sent down there to stop him doing. <laughs> but I got an enormous laugh with it, and I was so proud. It was the first laugh I'd ever had. I'd been a straight actor before. I'd never done something from the audience, and I was thrilled. And so after the show, Eric said, very good, I enjoyed that. You did that well. He said, what, what were you here for? I said, well, I was a spy. I'm coming here to spy on you and report on you. He said, well, what sort of spy are you going to be? I said, terrible. <laughs> And he said, do you want to come back next week? I said, yes. <laughs> so I came back the next week and I brought a character with me because I'd heard on the news and that's Al Valley at the end of the news. Good night. Here is the news in Norwegian. And the voice said, yeden, 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 make it a good up to boom I said, what? what? What did they say? And the next day I listened again. He said, yeden, 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 make it a good up to boom <laughs> So I went to a Norwegian that I knew at the Admiralty and I said, what does yeden, 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 make it a good up to boom bit mean? He said, nothing. I said, well, that's what they say every night. He said, well, debomb it probably means something to do with bombing. I said, well, it's very strange. So I went to Eric and I said, I've got a character for you. He said, what is it? I said, he's a Norwegian seaman. His name's Svensson. And Eric said, yes, what does he say? I said, he says, yeden, yoden, yeden, nigga, to go up debomb it. So Eric said, hmm, is that funny? I said, it will be. <laughs> and so when we came in and that week, he said, uh, ah, Svensson. And I said, yeden. He said, how are you? I said, yoden. He said, what have you been doing? I said, nigga, to go up debomb it. Within a fortnight, practically the entire United Kingdom was saying, yeden, 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 yeden. <laughs> And to this day, people sometimes come up to me and say, yeden, 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 yeden. So I was with him then for five years, which is good. Uh, I came out of the Navy and I stayed on with Eric in Waterlogged Spa for years and years and years. And I joined uh, Jewel and Warris in Up the Pole with Claude Dampier and had a big, big run with that. And I was doing plays at the same time. I did a play with Ralph Richardson called The Amazing Dr. Clitterhouse. And I did the music hall. I went into the music hall and was working at the Moss Empire Circuits. Music hall was an appalling experience, ladies and gentlemen, in certain theatres. Glasgow Empire, dear God, <laughs> was not the happiest place to be. <laughs> but I worked in Variety for many, many years and I enjoyed it. Mm. Mrs. Mack at Manchester. And there was a young lady who was in the company that I was rather enamoured of and uh, we were both staying at Mrs. Max. And I was this side of the house. She had two houses, with a stairway going up here and another house stairway going up there. And this lady friend of mine was staying in the other part of the house and I was staying in this part. And so I said, you pop up and I'll pop up and say goodnight. And so about half past twelve, one o'clock, I crept round and I crept up the stairs and sitting at the top of the stairs in a chair. <laughs> oh, no, you don't, Mr. Percy. No, we have nothing like that in this house. Thank you very much. Get back to your own bed, she said. I knew, I knew I could see the light in your eyes. <laughs> Wonderful, Mrs. Mack, great lady. I then decided that I'd do something else on radio. And it was a service show, we called it the Navy Lark. And it didn't take us long to get it set up. But the BBC takes a long time to do anything now, but it didn't then. It was very, very quick. And I got a producer called Alistair Scott Johnson, a very good writer called Laurie Wyman and George Evans. We were, up until last year, the longest running radio show in the history of broadcasting. I believe the HUD lines has now beaten us. We ran nearly 20 years. And it was a joyful occasion because we all used to meet on a Sunday, 25 weeks of the year, and uh, with Ronnie Barker, Tenniel Evans, Michael Bates, it's a great company of people. 
Ronnie Barker used to come with stories, the funniest stories you've ever heard, because he got them straight from the stock exchange, where all the best stories come from. He was with us for years and years and years, but he eventually had a lead because he became so popular in his own right. He hadn't the time to devote to being in the Navy Lark, so he sadly left. Alistair Scott Johnson said, well, who are we going to get to do all the voices that Ronnie does? And I said, get somebody else and I'll bloody well kill you. <laughs> he said, do you want to do them? I said, yes, I do. I was sick to death of the chief by this time. Right, left, end, down, and beep, so flip, so. And I got bored with that, and so I did a myriad other characters. I did about 40 characters for them. There was a, a character that I did in the Navy Lark called Admiral Birkinshaw. But we called him Admiral Firkinshaw. <laughs> because we said there are Birkinshaws, but there's no Firkinshaw. So we'll be all right. So there was Admiral Firkinshaw, and he was a terrible character. We got a telegram within three hours of transmission saying, I'm seeing my solicitor on Thursday at 10 o'clock to sue the BBC for the defamation of character, yours sincerely, Admiral Charles Firkinshaw. <laughs> and it was true. The character, that character that I've been doing for years in different forms was a lady who ran the tuck shop in the school I was at at Sherburn. And for years, boys said, one long bun, one short bun, please, Mrs. Thompson. And she used to say, thank you very much, Mr. Next. <laughs> she never knew one boy's name in 56 years, but she had a go. Thank you very much, Mr. Next. Wonderful. And one day when I was doing the Navy Lark, 10 11, Staffy Goldstein speaking, starboard look out here, sir. Taffy Goldstein said, why don't you put yourself up for Doctor Who? I hear Pat Troughton's leaving. And I said, well, I don't know why would they want me? He says, well, you'd be a very good doctor. So I rang my agent and I said, Richard, yeah. I said, I've got a very good idea. How about putting me up to play Doctor Who? Richard? <laughs> Richard? He said, yes? Oh, oh, so good. I thought you got... No, I, sorry, I, I quite understand. Yeah, it's not a very good idea. He said, no, I think it's a terrible idea. But I'll give it a whirl. And so he rang up to the producer and he said, Hello, this is Richard Stone. I'd like to suggest one of my clients to take over from Patrick Troughton as Doctor Who. And they said, Who? And he said, uh, John Pertwee. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Hello? He said, I had exactly the same reaction. Don't worry. And they said, No, we're gobsmacked. Our mouths are hanging open. We can't believe this. He said, Why? He said, May we read you our short list? that we've compiled 18 months ago. He said, yes. And they read it, and my name was second on it. It was the most extraordinary thing, and we never knew. I promise you, nobody knew. Daniel Evans didn't know when he suggested it. Nobody knew, but I know for a fact that it was true, because I knew a young girl who was a PA on the show, an assistant, and she said, no, you've been up for this for about 18 months. They've been talking about it. Now you're all dying to know who the first one was. <laughs> well, it was Ron Moody. Ron Moody. Uh, he was going to do it, but he couldn't do it, and, and, and so I was lucky I got it. Now, uh, there's a story interesting about this. I did a play in London called There's a Girl in My Soup, which was a tremendous hit in England and on Broadway. And so I went to America to play this with Gig Young. Gig Young, myself, and Barbara Ferris. And uh, we did the tour of America, but they never give you a contract for the Broadway production because they're very fly like that. They don't want to give it away. They said, we'll do you the tour and then you have another contract for Broadway if it comes. Well, we were a smash hit on the road, so I was just about to sign my contract for Broadway. When an irate producer came from England and he said, what the hell's name are you doing here? You're supposed to be in England. You're supposed to be doing a pilot for this show. I said, what pilot? He said, we gave you the script based on a character that you played in a thing called Beggar My Neighbour, where you and Reg Varney and Peter Jones and June Whitfield and Patty Coombs, you did this show and it was very successful and you played a bank manager and we've written this whole series round this. And you're supposed to be doing it. And I said, well, you never said anything positive. You didn't give me a contract. They said, well, anyway, we are offering it to you now. You're going to come back and do the pilot. And I said, well, it's either coming back to do the pilot for something that may be a complete flop, and I'm giving up a smash hit success on Broadway. You must be joking. No, there's no way. I'm not coming back. And so they said, oh, all right, we have to give it to somebody else. And they did. They gave it to Arthur Lowe, and it's called Dad's Army. <laughs> Could you believe it? I turned down Dad's Army. But still, after all, people turned down the Beatles, and they, they uh, can't be right all the time. I came back, of course, and I saw Arthur Lowe. Nobody in the world could be funnier than Arthur Lowe. I mean, he corpses me. I'm superb. I watch it over and over and over again. 
my cousin Bill, of course, is in it, and he tells me all sorts of wonderful stories about Arthur. I could never have played it like that, but Mark, I probably wouldn't have had to. They would let me play it in my own way. Sean Sutton, who was the head of programme, said, you want to play Doctor Who? And I said, yes, but how do I play it? And he said, as John Pertwee. And I said, who the hell's that? I've never been John Pertwee. Never. I've no idea who John Pertwee is. I've hidden under a green umbrella all my career, like Peter Sellers. I've never been me. And not up till that time, I hadn't been. So he said, oh, don't worry, we'll find you. And so I got the job, and I did the very first one, and my God, was I embarrassed. When I look now at those scenes when I'm standing in front of a mirror, trying on funny hats, and that awful, embarrassing scene in a shower with a shower hat, oh, terrible. But luckily, my producers left, and Barry Letts, the actor, he came in and took over, and he really knew about actors, and he understood what I was trying to do, and I wanted to play a character for the first time in my life, straight down the middle, to play it for real, make it believable even though I was all flamboyant and this folk hero figure, you know, with a frilly shirt. And that was an accident, because they wanted me to do something for the front page of the Radio Times, and I went to my wardrobe and I found a, a, a velvet smoking jacket, which was rather trendy at the time, and a Mr. Fish frilly shirt, and I found a pair of black trousers and some elastic-sided boots uh, that I'd worn in pantomime, uh, and a cape that my grandfather used to wear, an Inverness cape. And so I put this on. Ah! You may remember that photograph. Wah! And they, they looked at it, they said, that's damn good. I said, well, yeah, but how the hell do we explain it away in the first programme? He said, oh, we'll find a way. And we did. You remember, I came out of the hospital bed uh, and I went into the changing room where all the doctors were and I nicked various articles of clothing, a cape from an eccentric old man uh, and a hat, which we abandoned and Tom Baker picked up with afterwards, and thank God. Uh, and, and everything else was pinched from, from this, this locker room. And then I went out and I pinched the old man's car. And that was the beginning of Bessie, you know, driving the old Edwardian roadster. And so when I said to the brigadier, can I keep these clothes in the car? He said, no, you can't. You've got to turn them, give them back, but we'll get you some others like it. And so for all the years I was in Doctor Who, I wore these flamboyant, lovely clothes. The cape sort of represented the wings of the mother hen, you know, with the chicks underneath. And uh, it was rather symbolic, I thought. Barry Letts sent for me when he hadn't been very long, and he said, look, I've got to have a chat to you. He said, I don't think you're taking this thing very seriously. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're always laughing about. I mean, you're, you're always laughing. You're all in hysterics. You and Katie Manning are in hysteria all the time. John Levine can, you can't get a word out of him. He's always laughing. What, what's going on? He said, we've got a job to do. And I said, Barry, have we ever been late? He said, no. I said, have, have we any have, have, have dried up badly or held you up? He said, no. And I said, have we sort of held up production in any way? He said, no. And I said, then what the hell are you worrying about? I said, what I'm doing is I'm making people have fun. And if people have fun, you get work done. Look at you doing a factory floor or something and everybody's enjoying themselves. You get much more work done. And that's what made it good with us. Nick Courtney, in one in Inferno, wore a black patch and a scar. And he had his back turned to us. And I said, I tell you what we'll do. And Caroline John and myself and John Levine, I said, we'll all put scars on our faces and we'll all have black patches. <laughs> And when he's got his back to us, and we'll go in, and we'll say, he's, he's going to turn around and he said, Now look here, Doctor, I've told you before. I said, Neil, take one look at us, and he'll corpse him. <laughs> See, so we did this, and we all put the black patches on, and we would, I said, Come on, get, put yourself together, John, because John Levine was in hysterics before he started. <laughs> and they came through the door, and I went, <clears throat> which was the cue for Nick to turn round. And Nick turned round, he looked at me, and he said, Now look here, Doctor, I've told you before, and I won't tell you again. He paid no attention whatsoever. <laughs> So all of us fell on the floor laughing <laughs> and the director got furious and took, chucked us all out and said, stop buggering about for Christ's sake and let's get on with it and do it properly. You can't throw Nick. A wonderful guy, superb. I work with him all the time. Whenever I do any shows I can, I use Nick. And so it, the whole team was great. Roger and John and Richard Franklin, Katie, Liz Sladen, all of us get on tremendously, tremendously well. All the doctors, well, not all, most of the doctors. <laughs> Patrick Troughton, he and I were in the Navy together. He, he was very eccentric. When he was in MTBs. And when he used to go out in action and it was cold, he wore a tea cosy on his head. <laughs> I've got a wonderful photograph of Pat going out to sea on the bridge with a tea cosy on his head. He said, it's all so bloody cold. He said, I can't remember. That tin hat, ridiculous thing. He said, tea cosy. When we were working together, we were doing a thing called The, the Three Doctors. 
with Bill Hartnell, and poor Bill was very sick. He couldn't uh, appear really with us. We shot him all on, on a screen, on a visual screen. Uh, Pat and I worked together, and um, Pat was under the TARDIS console, and he's supposed to say something like, I put the chine screw in the Ropsit, you see? And I'm supposed to say, but that's not where it should be. And he said, oh God, I've dropped it. <laughs> and I said, stop, cut, hold on. Sorry, what was that, Pat? He said, what? And I said, what was that you said? He said, well, malign. I said, it wasn't. You said, oh God, I've dropped it. You're supposed to say something completely different. He said, oh, Christ, that's near enough. <laughs> And I said, no, it is not. I said, I'm the doctor now, not you. I said, you say the cue and be done with it, because I can't, I need cues. Oh, God, bloody, he said, wonderful man. And then when that was over, I was asked to do a film. I was asked to do a, a big, big picture by Keith Waterhouse and Willis Hall. They said, would you like to make a movie of Wurzel Gummidge? And of course, I'd read it as a book as a child, the Barbara Euphon Todd's books in the 30s. And it had been played on radio with uh, Norman Shelley and been enormously successful. And I loved the books. And I said, oh, God, yes, I'd love to. They remembered the character, the postman. They remembered this, this West Country character that I played. So they said, would you like to play it? Now, unfortunately, we couldn't get it off the ground. It was very sad. No money. We couldn't get the distribution. And so they abandoned it. And I said, please don't do that. Write me a pilot. And they wrote me a very short pilot. So I gave it eventually to Lewis Rudd, who was a very perspicacious man uh, from Southern Television. And he said, oh, I think this is wonderful, it's magic. And we did it, and it took us 18 months to get it on the air. It was uh, certainly the, the greatest fun thing that I've ever been involved with. I, I loved it. Because you ran the gamut of emotions from A to Z in 25 minutes. And, and if you got stuck, you changed your head. <laughs> uh, which was an idea I had, because with, with the TARDIS, you see, you can go forward and back in time. And I thought, well, that's what we can do with Wurzel. He takes his head off and puts another head on, so he can be anything. Uh, from a, you can be a singing head or a writing head or a thinking head or any guy, any guy, a daft head. <laughs> and so it worked. And within weeks, well, you all know what happened to it. It became the, one of the top rated shows in the country. We had 12 and a half million viewers a week and we were on at 5.30 in the afternoon. We knocked uh, Doctor Who into a cocked hat, which was funny because I'm knocking myself into a cocked hat because I, my repeats were showing at the time. But it, we, we had enormous success with it, uh, I'm happy to say. Yeah, because I'll tell you for a while, because when I was doing, when I were doing Dr. Who, say, yeah, I were, num I were number three. And when I was doing Words of Government, I was number one. There weren't nobody, apart from radio, but nobody on Telly Welly did it. <laughs> so so I, I'd, I'd done it there for Telly Welly, and I had somebody nice to do it with, with, with old Eunice Stubbs. She's proper, she is, she's lovely. <laughs> she's a right bitch in the show, but she's lovely. <laughs> And Geoffrey Bell done what him what plays the, the crow man. He were lovely too. And one day we were doing a scene together, Geoffrey and I, and I, I just said, Mr. Crowman, sir, I've done the most terrible thing. I said, I've torn one of my Aunt Sally's legs off, and there's only one thing for it, and that's to put me on the compost heap. <laughs> he said, Where's all? I think you're right. I, I can't think. And the tears were coming down, and I stopped, and the shot said, what the bloody hell are you crying for? I said, I'm supposed to be doing the crying here, not you. He said, I can't help it, it's so new. <laughs> so we had a lot of people in tears with that. It was lovely, the gorgeous show to do. I remember Beryl Reed playing my mother, who was supposed to chase me with a pitchfork. And she was chasing me along with this pitchfork and she was going about that much every five minutes. And, and I said, oh, Beryl, for God's sake, come on, give us a chase or a prod or something. I'm going to run away from something. And she didn't, and the director said, come on, Beryl, move your stumps. I mean, you know, chase him, he's got to be frightened of you. And she said, darling, I was booked for the acting, not the bloody running. <laughs> <laughs> they carry on films. Peter Rogers, the director and the producer, they both said to me, do you want to be in the carry-ons? I said, no. I said, because I'm very busy in the film business, I'm making a lot of films, British quota pictures, granted, not international movies. And I said, because all your marvellous actors you've got, like Kenneth Connor, Kenneth Williams, Sid James, are terrific actors. I mean, really great actors. And what are they doing now? Nothing but carry-ons. Their career is finished. <laughs> <laughs>
They just do carry-ons. That's all they can do. And this is what Kenneth Williams' whole career was ruined by that. Oh, I mean, he did a lot of other things as well, but as an actor, it was. So I didn't want this to happen to me. But eventually, Peter rang me and said, look, yeah, I'd like you to do this, because I think you could stand up to Kenneth Williams. He said he's causing us a lot of trouble at the minute. And I said, well, what's he doing? He said, well, he's gone so far now is that when visitors come onto the set, he turns round and moons them. <laughs> I'm sure that some ladies who don't know what mooning is, somebody would explain it to them. And he used to actually drop his trousers and moon to the people that came in on the floor. And they said, Kenneth, please, what are you doing? And he said, oh, well, 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 and he, he, he did his moon. And so they said, perhaps you could stop him. And I said, oh, thanks very much. <laughs> Nobody can stop Kenneth, and they never could. I mean, he used to do dreadful things to Charlie Hawtrey. Charlie Hawtrey used to have a plastic bag, and it were, were five woodbines, the Times crossword and a pencil, and a sarnie and an apple. And every single day, Kenneth Williams stole it and hid it. <laughs> every day. And Charlie would say, where's my plastic bag? And everybody would go, ah, <laughs> you got this in the set. Oh, every day it went on, all this hoo -ah. <laughs> So I did four. The first one I did, I looked like a very old Yorkshire terrier with the hair all over here playing the soothsayer <laughs> in Carry On Cleo. I did Carry On Cowboy. The script was quite funny, and I said, can I make him blind? He said, yeah. He said, yes, it is, go on, yeah. Can I make him deaf? He said, yeah, go on, yeah, go on. So I made him everything. So when you see him, the cowboy, you know, he couldn't see, he couldn't hear, and he walked into walls and got on his horse backwards and made a bit of fun out of it. And then I played a very strange character, didn't I? I turned, I turned the thumb into a monster. I don't know what that one was. What was it? <laughs> Carry on screaming, I think. Anyway, they, they were fun, but they were just cameos, and I enjoyed it. I had fun in all of them, except the last one, and dear God, that was the worst films ever made. Carry on, Columbus. Now, here's a funny joke about that. My wife said that, uh, that Susie, your agent, she'd rung up, and she said that you, it's a marvellous job for John, is, is in Columbus. Now, I knew that Gerard Depardieu was playing this big Columbus film, and I thought, wonderful, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be in a Depardieu film, marvellous. They said, the script's coming tomorrow. And I waited for the postman to come, and, and the, the script came through the door, and I rushed, and I opened it, and it was Carry On Columbus. And I'd never been more disappointed in my life. And when I got down there the very first day, I walked into the makeup room, and there was one of our most eminent actresses, Maureen Lippman. And I said, hello, Maureen, dear. And she said, hello, darling. I said, well, what are you doing here? And she said, same as you, dear, trying to earn a buck. I said, but not in Carry On Columbus. And she said, yes. I said, you in Carry On Columbus? She said, you wait till you see the Archbishop of Canterbury who's going to marry you. That was T.P. McKenna, one of our top dramatic <laughs> actors. He only had one line, they cut that out. <laughs> well, there we go. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much indeed. I've had a most wonderful time, I don't know about you. But I, I've had a lovely time, and thanks for your attention and, and for your humour. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>